We had rode our bikes. Yeah, exactly. Now, you'll, if you want to come by Beth's around 1 o'clock today, you'll see it again. I'll be out there mowing. Catch a sighting in, in the flesh. But you better wear sunglasses. Exactly. exactly. If you want to see that in the flesh, you better wear sunglasses. <laughs> Ivan and Wanda are gone, and Bill and Marla are gone, and and uh, I know the Renfro's had been in the Bahamas this week, and uh, Janie's in the Bahamas, I think, and uh, so. But anyway, we've got a lot of folks, a lot of folks traveling for the summer, and uh, also just some sickness and other things going on. Uh, Billy and Nicole sent me a text and said they had, John had been at his grandparents this week and they were going to pick him up today. So uh, they were going to be gone. And so again, we just got lots of families gone, but we're here, aren't we? And so we're going to sing that, we're going to worship, we're going to praise, and we're going to study today and just enjoy our time of fellowship and time together. Let's stand up, ask God to bless our time. Let's pray. Father God, we ask your blessings on us today. We ask you to watch over us, to be with us, to lead us, to guide us. Help us to worship you in spirit and in truth. We pray for our families that are on the road today. And we just ask you to be with them and take care of them. And uh, we're thankful, Lord, that we're uh, in a nation where we can take time off and go and uh, recharge the batteries. And so, Lord, we just ask you to uh, watch over us and watch over our families here. Help us to love you more and to love each other. And Father, just be with James and Linda as they lead our worship today. Help us to sing out and support them and their efforts to lead us to worship you. Be with Chuck in our communion time and just be with our study today. Again, Lord, we just praise you and love you. And it's through the blessed name of our Savior Jesus we ask all these things. Amen. Good morning. We're going to start out with the Be Exalted, O God, and we're going to go through this one time. I will give thanks to Thee, O Lord, among the people. I will sing praises to Thee among the nations. For thy steadfast love is great, it is great to the heavens, and thy faithfulness, thy faithfulness to the clouds. Be exalted, O God, above the heavens, let thy glory Fortress 
four. This will be the song for prayer. <laughs> Let's look at our prayer list this morning. Um, <coughs> both Kathy of uh, Kathy's parents were not feeling well this morning, so she sent me a text and good morning, Kathy. She said she was going to log in, watch it on the live feed. Um, so we need to remember her parents in our prayers. Um, Sue Jackson has not been doing very well, and so we need to lift her up in prayer. Uh, knee issues and all kinds of things going on, and so we uh, we need to lift up Sue in her prayers. In fact, I had uh, when I got here this morning, there was a message on the answer machine um, from Friday uh, that said Sue uh, was not doing well at all, and so I called both the numbers that they left, which one of them was Sue's home, and, and I got voicemails on both, and so I left them voicemails, and um, when Jolene and Rowena got here, I asked Rowena, and Rowena had talked to Sue yesterday, so um, we just need to uh, lift them up in prayers, and so <clears throat> pray for them. Um, all the ones uh, that we mentioned earlier, traveling and things going on, Beth had a PET scan this week, and they're checking for cervical cancer. And so she'll have the results of that tomorrow. So as soon as she hears and I hear, I will let everybody know um, the results of that. So we need to be praying for uh, Beth's healing. Who else do we need to add to our list? Anybody? Man, with everybody traveling, um, got uh, lots. Let me check the list here one more time to make sure. Um, Bill Truesdale was supposed to be coming through um, all week long. We've, we've Chuck and I have talked to him, and the days kept getting put off. He finally called us yesterday and told us he wasn't coming. So um, he is going to Tennessee, but he's not not coming by here. So anyway, we just we need to continue to lift Bill up in our prayers. There's just a whole lot going on there, and so we just need to lift him up in prayer. Um, if there's nobody else, let's stand and join hands and we'll pray. Small circle. Last week it was too big a circle, so... Let's, let's pray. Lord, thank you for the blessings that you give us. We ask you to watch over us today. Father, uh, continue to just help us to love you and to love each other. Father, we pray today for Sue and we pray for her healing. We pray that you touch her and that you be with her. 
And we pray for Kathy's parents. We ask you to watch over them. And we pray for their healing. And for Beth, Father, we pray for good results tomorrow. And we just pray for your healing to her, that you strengthen her, and that you watch over her, and that you take care of her. Uh, we pray for Bill, and we pray for a change of heart. And, and Father, we, we've prayed and lifted him up. And Father, we just continue to ask you to touch his life. And we pray that you take care of him. And we pray for Casey, and we pray for her healing, and that you watch over her and take care of her. And Father, um, for Charlie Phillips, we pray for your continued healing of his heart. And then, Father, we ask you to be with so many of our families that are traveling today. And we pray, Father, that you will watch over them and take care of them and bless them. And Father, we just praise you and we love you. And we ask you to continue to be with so many on our list. We're glad that Linda is better. And we pray for Joe. And we pray for healing of her hip. And now that she has a surgery date, we pray, Father, that you will watch over her, and that you will take care of her, and that you'll be with her. And Father, um, again, we just ask for your touch to be upon all those on our list today, that you heal them, and that you take care of them, and that you watch over them. Father, we praise you and we love you. And it's through Jesus we pray. Amen. All right, you can be seated. I've remembered too, just as I was closing the prayer, I remembered too. Um, you'll notice Glenn and Carolyn are back with us today, and he's looking for a, they're looking for more employment. So we need to lift them up in prayer and pray they'll find the right job. And uh who knows, maybe we can just pray pray that God will provide one even right here that will pay him what he's worth and, and uh, uh, just just continue to lift them up in prayers. They, this trip kind of turned into a real hardship for you guys this last time, so we just really need to... But we're glad to see you back. We're glad you're here. So. power in the blood verse 1 2 and 4 and this will be the song before communion would you be free from the burden of sin there's power in the blood power in the blood would you or evil a victory win there's wonderful power in the blood there is power Would you 
Good morning, everybody. Morning. Fitting that we uh, just sang that song because uh, I wanted to read to you this morning the parable of the lost sheep, and then I'm going to tell you why I thought about this. Okay? So, uh, Luke chapter 15, starting in uh, verse 1. Now the tax collectors and sinners were all gathering around <clears throat> to were all gathering around to hear Jesus. But the Pharisees and the teachers of the law muttered, This man welcomes sinners and eats with them. Then Jesus told them this parable. Suppose one of you has a hundred sheep and loses one of them. Doesn't he leave the ninety-nine in the open country and go after the lost sheep until he finds it? And when he finds it, he joyfully puts it on his shoulders and goes home and then calls his friends and neighbors together and says, Rejoice with me, I have found my lost sheep. I tell you that in the same way there will be more rejoicing in heaven over one sinner who repents than over the ninety-nine righteous persons who do not need to repent. <clears throat> okay. <clears throat> so, this morning, uh, I'm looking for these. Without these, I can't read that. And I'm frantic. And it's like, where are my glasses? Of course, Shell is, um, she's always, you know, telling me about, you know, make sure you keep all your stuff in one area, you know, so you can, in which I normally do, but my glasses had slipped between the seat and the console and then down underneath the seat where I couldn't see them when I was looking for them. So I looked all over the house, almost tore the house apart. The last place I looked is where I found them. Okay, so I'm thinking to myself, you know, I'm still trying to think about what I'm going to talk about this morning. And so Shell comes up, she says, you know, you should probably talk about being lost. <laughs> and I thought to myself, you know, that's really kind of what I was thinking about. So, you know, we were lost. Jesus came to earth and he, he searched for us and he found those of us that are lost. He's still looking for those that are lost. and. You know, in my mind, I, th I think he's as frantic as I was looking for my glasses, that he's looking for us. And so he came and he died for us. He taught us great lessons in life. And he left this communion time for us to remember that. So if you would, please pray with me. Father, we're so thankful for all that you've given us. We're thankful that your son, Jesus, came, and that he searched for us and is still searching for us searching for those who, who are lost. So Father, we just give thanks that we have this time that we can gather, that we can remember, that we can celebrate that we've been found, and that Jesus loves us, and that you love us. And it's in Jesus' name we pray, amen. Okay, gentlemen.
celebrate together that we're no longer lost. <clears throat> you pray with me for the offering? Father, again, we're just thankful for all that you've given us. We're thankful that we're able to give back a portion of what you've blessed us with, that the work of the kingdom may be continued. Father, we just pray for wisdom and, and, and how it's spent and to take care of those who are in need. Father, again, we just give thanks for this time. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. You would turn in your Bibles to Mark chapter 7. Mark chapter 7. We're going to study a while in Mark chapter 7. Ricky and Tammy, good to see you guys back. You had a good week off. Good, good deal. <laughs> oh, my goodness. Mark chapter 7, beginning in verse 1. Let's read together. We're going to read 23 verses together. I know it's a lengthy reading, but just bear with me. Um, let's read together. The Pharisees and some of the teachers of the law who had come from Jerusalem gathered around Jesus and saw some of his disciples eating food with hands that were defiled, that is, unwashed. The Pharisees and all the Jews do not eat unless they give their hands a ceremonial washing according to the tradition of the elders. When they come from the marketplace, they do not eat unless they wash. And they observe many other traditions, such as the washing of cups and pitchers and kettles. So the Pharisees and the teachers of the law asked Jesus, Why do your disciples live according to the tradition? Why don't your disciples live according to the traditions of the elders? Instead of eating their food with defiled hands. He replied, Isaiah was right. When he prophesied about you hypocrites, as it is written, these people honor me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. They worship me in vain. Their teachings are merely human rules. You have let go of the commands of God and are holding on to human traditions. He continued, you have a fine way of setting aside the commands of God in order to observe your own traditions. For Moses said, honor your mother and father. And anyone who curses his father or mother is to be put to death. But you say that if anyone declares that <clears throat> what they might have been used to help their father or mother is korban, that is devoted to God, then you no longer let them do anything for their father or mother. Thus you nullify the word of God by your tradition that you have handed down, and you do many things like that. Again, Jesus called the crowd to him and said, Listen to me, everyone, and understand this. Nothing outside the person can defile them by going into it. Rather, it is what comes out of the person that defiles them. After he had left the crowd and entered the house, his disciples asked him about this parable. Are you so dull, he asked? Don't you see that nothing that enters a person from the outside can defile them? For it doesn't go into the heart, but into their stomach and then out of the body. In saying this, Jesus declared all foods clean. He went on, what comes out of a person is what defiles them. For it is from within 
out of a person's heart that evil thoughts come, sexual immorality, theft, murder, adultery, greed, malice, deceit, lewdness, envy, slander, arrogance, and folly. All these evils come from inside and defile a person. Now, I'm the type of person, and I've, I've grown in this attitude, I don't like symbolism over substance. I don't like doing something just because of the symbolism of it. I don't like doing something just because we've always done it. I want a reason for it. I, and, and I think that, you know, for, for years, the church, the, the church, the kingdom of God, buys into these ideas that we've got to do something simply because we've always done it. And it's very difficult, it's very difficult to change that. Once something becomes said as a tradition, that it becomes the tradition. And I've seen it through the years. I've told this story so many times here about how we set a tradition and it was all my fault. How that the way we do communion every Sunday where we take the cup and the bread and we hold them and we take them together, which I think is an awesome tradition. I think it's an awesome symbolism. And the symbolism between holding the cup and the bread is that we're taking it together and we're declaring something that we're united together, not only as a body and in purpose and in cause, but we're saying, let me tell you something, I'm as united with the person across the, across the auditorium from me because I am united with them in that I needed the blood of Jesus to, to cleanse me. And so there's some great symbolism in that. But I'll never forget because it was back in the... It it was a long time ago. I mean, I can't even remember how far back it was, but I had said we had always served communion, and the way we served was it went by, and everybody took. You took the cup, and you, you put the cup in the holder, and it, and it went on. And I mean, we just, we just did it, and it, it became off to the races when we were serving communion. And one Sunday I was preaching on, uh, from 1 Corinthians and talking about us being united together and all that. And I said, it would be so neat if today that during our, the sermon time we would pause and we'd take communion and we'd all hold the cup in the bread. I said, what do you guys think about that? And everybody went, that's a great idea. Let's do that. And we've done it ever since. My plan was to do it one Sunday and then we'd be back the next Sunday to off to the races. But it's been a great thing that we started. It was a great tradition, so I can understand that. I've had people ask me that have visited, why do y'all hold the cup and the bread and take it together? And I get to explain to them. I get to say there's actually a biblical reason why we do that. We're not saying you do it wrong. If you do it different from us, we're just saying that's our tradition. But let me tell you, when a tradition takes over, when something takes over and it becomes a symbolism, pretty soon what ends up happening is that we worship the symbol. It becomes the most important thing that we do. I grew up in a tradition that does that, where we worshiped worship. What? Yes, we worshiped worship. And it became the, the thing. It became the call of fellowship to the, that if you didn't worship correctly, if you didn't do it right, then you weren't right with God. And then it went even further. It became almost a sacrament. They would never use those kind of terms in the fellowship that I grew up in, but it's what they, have, they do. They say, if you don't worship correctly, and there were five acts of correct worship, and if you didn't do those five acts of correct worship, if you skipped one of them, if you dared to leave one of the five off, then your soul's eternity was in jeopardy. Once, just once, of doing it wrong, and you'd better repent. And it's nothing but, it was nothing but based in tradition. The call was, the call originally among that fellowship was, let's get back to the Bible. Let's only do what the Bible says. Let's just do it that way. And pretty soon there were some things that were established that became tradition that became more powerful than the Word of God. It was like I was asked once in an assembly when I was preaching at a different church and that tells you it's a long time ago because I've been here a long time. But I was asked once to answer a question. We had Sunday night question and answer time. And the question was asked of me. Can a woman serve communion? And so we divided the questions up. Me and the other elders, we divided the questions up. 
I stood up with my question, and I read my question. Can a woman serve communion on Sunday? I said yes, and I sat down. And everybody went, no, 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 no. Get back up there. We need more explanation of this. I said, listen, guys, you've got to understand something. You cannot give a biblical directive towards something that is not biblical. And they went, well, wait a minute. Communion is biblical. Yes, communion is biblical. Correct? Participating in communion is a biblical thing. Jesus said, whenever you do this, do this in remembrance of me. And the early church did it every day for a while. We know they did it on the first day of the week. But in the early church, they were getting together. They were breaking bread together. And one of the symbols of breaking bread, one of the terms of breaking bread, was the participation of communion. They were not only eating a meal together, but they were remembering Jesus because they were together. They were so excited about being saved that they did it every day. Together. They were meeting with believers. But the way that we do it with trays, you're not going to find in Scripture. I challenge you, right? Now, see, that makes us uncomfortable because all of a sudden we're going, wait a minute, you know what I'm saying? You understand? We go, right? You cannot find, right, correctly, you cannot find that a bunch of folks gather around a table in the Bible, they gather around a table with a bunch of trays and folks handed it out, right? What's it say? It just says they did it. What's amazing is it doesn't say how they did it, right? So now that leaves us open, correct? We could use some paper plates and cups up here, couldn't we? Correct? I think if we did it, there'd be heart attacks and I'd be doing funerals for a month. Because we wouldn't know how to handle it, would we? It's like on Sundays where we've changed things up, and then rather than serving it, we've said, you've got to come down here. I remember the very first time we ever did that where I said, okay, we're going to have you line up and come down here and get it and go sit down. There were people that sat there going, can we do that? Is that okay? Will God zap me on the way down there? I mean, you know, it's like we just, we get wrapped up in things. And so I answered the question, and I said, when you can biblically dictate how it's done, Then you can determine who can serve it. And I said there would be absolutely nothing. It doesn't say about who does it. It just says do it, correct? That's biblically sound. But I said whatever your tradition is, whatever you're comfortable with in serving it, serve it that way. That's biblical. That will keep you unified. Because the important thing is not what? Who serves it, but what? that we do it, and why we're doing it. If we just do it because it's our habit, we sing through, we're, we're very habit-oriented, and James threw me off a little bit this morning. We sang three songs, and I kept watching, and he didn't go sit down, and he's standing there, and he's turning in his hymn book, and I go, we're fixing to sing another song, and I'm looking at the screen, and the screen went dark, and I went, that's my cue to get up to pray. But he's still standing there, and I'm watching Linda, and she's turning, and I'm like, they're not giving me a signal. They're not giving, I thought, I'm just going to pray. I'm just going to get up and I'm going to pray. So we're very tradition oriented. If we just do it where we sing three songs and we pray and we sing two songs and we serve communion and we lose sight of why we're doing it, something's missing, correct? Right? Y'all are acting like you're scared to go, yeah, that's right. God's not going to zap you. Tradition is very powerful. And there's nothing wrong with traditions. I've seen families fight. I've seen, I've seen young couples, when they get married, fight because they'd come to Christmas. A friend of mine, never, never forget, a friend of mine tell me, another preacher tell me about when he first got married, that he went with his wife to her family for Christmas. And he says all the way home he was telling her how, how he didn't feel like he'd celebrated Christmas because they just did everything wrong. It was just hilarious, you know. He said, "My goodness, we got over there, and y'all, y'all just y'all. Y- 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 the meal, the food was wrong. It wasn't Christmassy food, and it wasn't this, and it wasn't that, and all the way home. And it just, he said, fussed, and he said he just had her in tears on the way home, and he said he just felt terrible, you know, afterwards." And he realized something, I mean, because tradition, you know, a family tradition can be very, very powerful. 
And church tradition can become very, very powerful. And that's exactly what Jesus is dealing with here. These guys are coming in, and they come to Jesus, and they said, listen, we've noticed something about your disciples. They come in, and they're watching. Now, I'm going to tell you something. There is nothing harder. There is nothing in the world harder than dealing with religious people who come in and sit down and just watch you. That's tough. When I was in Bible school down in Dallas, we had to do something twice while we were while we were enrolled in the school as preacher students, something that we had to do when you were a sophomore, you had to preach in chapel, and when you were a senior, you had to preach in chapel. Let me tell you something. There is nothing in the world harder than standing up before a group of guys who every one of them is sitting there thinking they can do it better, and they're looking to critique you. And they'll critique everything from the straightness of your tie to the part of your hair to the words that you use. And when you're an old southern boy like me who can barely speak English, You get up there watching, and I'd see those prepositions waiting for me at the end of a sentence, and they ended up there anyway. And it was tough. And then the instructors, the professors, would be sitting in the back, and they're critiquing you, and they're writing. One of my teachers was back there in the back, and he's writing. Oh, Herman Alexander, I'll never forget. He's back there, and he's writing, and he's like this as I'm speaking, and there's just silence in the chapel service, and I'm like... What did I say? And, I'm, and then you have to go eat lunch with them. And they tell you everything you did wrong. And I got there and I'm just waiting. And he sits down and I went, Okay, Brother Alexander, I've got to ask, What in the world did you write so viciously back there? And he went, Oh, I was writing down, you made a really good point. And I was really stressing that that was a good point. And I'm going to use that if you don't mind. And I went, Oh. And he said, but the rest of it lacked something. But that one point was really, really good. And I was like, oh. But there's nothing harder. And so that's what these folks do. They come in and they're watching Jesus, you know, the new guy in town. The new, the new rabbi's shown up and he's stirring a crowd and he's doing these magic tricks. They're thinking. And he showed up and so they're just like, we're going to watch you. You know. It's like we were at a fellowship meal in Dallas, Texas. Now, they're at the, at the Preston Road Church back when we attended there. Their fellowship dinners were different. I've shared this before, but it just fits here. We go to the fellowship meal. They announce we're having fellowship potluck, blah, 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 you know, on this Sunday. So we show up with our dish for the potluck. We go in. We go, where do we put, our, where do we put this? This needs to go in the refrigerator for dinner today. And these people are looking at us like we're insane. And I'm like, what is wrong? And they said, our potlucks are catered. (laughs) What? They're catered. But we'll put this out. I'm like, well, well, that's what happens when you go to church with millionaires. You know, now I've shared the story about the very first Sunday we rolled up there. I parked between a Mercedes and a Jaguar, and I drove a 75 Ford Bronco that the doors would swing all the way around on, and it was lifted, big tires, and it backfired when you shut it off. I shut it off, and it went boom, boom, because it had glass packs. So here we come roaring up. The Beverly Hillbillies have arrived. There's people sitting in that Jaguar, and I opened my door, and it swung all the way around because that's the way those Broncos were made. They were made to easily take the doors open. I swing that door open, and it just barely misses that Jaguar, and those people are like, dear God in heaven, who is here? I've also shared at that church you had to wear a coat and a tie to wait to serve communion. If you did not have a coat and a tie, they did not allow you to serve communion. Now, that church has totally changed today. It's a different, different mindset, different leadership, different everything. But so that we're sitting at the potluck, and I'm sitting across the table from Tony Scott. Now, she was a blessed, sweet lady, her and her husband. Her husband was an elder in the church. We're sitting there, and I got done, and they'd had pot roast, mashed potatoes, gravy, all the vegetables. Now, I'm sitting there, and I've got half a roll left, and I've got gravy on my plate. There is temptation for any good southerner, correct? Because you know what I'm going to do. I took that roll, and I went, popped the whole half of that roll in my mouth, and I'm just happy, happy, happy. I'm thinking, what do they got for dessert? 
And I look across the table, and she is looking at me like, And I said, uh, and she goes, oh, no, 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 no. And I went, yes. <laughs> and she said, N if you, you never, you never sop your plate. And I went, I grew up sopping my plate. That's what bread was put on the table for, right? It wasn't just to look pretty with butter on it. It was to shine that plate up because... When you hand wash dishes, you didn't dirty it up with a dessert plate unless company was there. So you did this with your bread, then you put your dessert right back on that plate. And so she explained to me and gave me a lesson on sopping my plate with my leftover bread. And that was you tear a little piece off, you lay it on the plate, you take your fork, you move it around. She goes, now that's only if you must do this. I still... You sit down with me to eat, it's entertainment, you know, because I enjoy my food almost as much as my daughter-in-law does. <laughs> so Jesus, the Pharisees are sitting there and they're watching. We've all been in this experience. The religious people are sitting there and they're like, we'll keep our eyes on you guys. And they notice. <gasps> They didn't. They're eating with defiled hands. Now, it's not that Jesus' disciples, I don't want you to get the idea that Jesus' disciples were pigs and didn't wash their hands. They had. They would have washed their hands. The point is they didn't give it the ceremonial washing, the declaring them clean, the declaring them undefiled hands. And they're eating and they're like... <gasps> And they says, you know, they don't, they go to the marketplace and they get something and they come back and they wash their hands. They wash with the ceremony, they do the ceremony. They wash the kettles, the pots, the whole thing. They would go in and they would simply declare them clean. They'd say, these things are clean. Some of us guys that lived as bachelors have declared clothes clean before. I guarantee you Clayton at some point has looked at a shirt and he picked out the least dirty one and put it on. <laughs> uh, Jeffrey too <laughs> there you go <laughs> you know you pick it up you go oh no that one won't oh no that one oh, oh that was not too bad put that sucker on add deodorant we're good right they declared them clean they would declare them clean and so they're just instantly so at this moment the Pharisees have got their aha moment they've got them We've got him. And so they turn to Jesus. Verse 5. So the Pharisees and the teacher of the law asked Jesus, Why don't your disciples live according to the traditions of the elders instead of eating their food with defiled hands? Now they'd given their hands, they'd, they'd gone through the ceremonial washing. I, I years ago had preached through the book of Mark, and I illustrated that, how, how they did that. What they did was they held their hands over a, a pot, and they poured water, and they let the water run down. And once the water dripped off, they, you know, they went in there almost like surgeons, you know, going in to operate before they put the gloves on. You know, our hands are clean. Or, you know, some of you boys, some of you guys remember when your boys giving your hands a ceremonial washing. You know, my mother, I'd come in, she'd say, I know there's no telling what you've got in your pockets and what you've handled. Go wash your hands. And so I'd run in there because I'm ready to eat, you know, because I've got things to do. Let's get this supper over with so we can get back outside. We're burning daylight. And so I'd run in and I'd run my hands under the water. I'd get them wet and then I'd grab the towel and I'd wipe them off. And then I'd look at the towel. Oh, dear Lord. And that's what I call a ceremonial washing, you know. It wasn't really washed. They just got wet, and I made mud on the towel. But then I'd run in and sit down to eat because I had things to do. They would give their hands this ceremony. So they look at Jesus, and they're like, why are your disciples not living according to the traditions of the elders? Why aren't they doing the right thing? They think they've got him. They hadn't broken anything but tradition. They hadn't fought. It wasn't that God laid out and said, okay, go through this process before you eat any meal. You can't find that in the Old Testament. You can find what was clean and unclean to eat. You can find the process. You can find the process of preparing your house for Passover. You can find the process for preparing things. But you cannot find a process that says, this is how you wash your hands. God leaves that up and goes, that's pretty common sense, isn't it? 
God didn't want the washing of hands to be something that all of a sudden determined your rightness or wrongness with Him. Why aren't you living according to the traditions of the elders? And notice what Jesus says, verse 6. He replied, Isaiah was right when he prophesied about, prophesied about you hypocrites. As it is written, these people honor me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. They worship me in vain. Their teachings are merely human rules. You have let go of the commands of God and are holding on to the traditions of men. This is when tradition gets dangerous. Tradition for you gets very dangerous the second it outweighs this. The second that I could read a scripture, in the fellowship that I grew up in, I could read a scripture that could set people off, and I'd go, I just read scripture, right? And that would, because it would go against our very tradition of who we were as people. Jesus looks at them and he goes, boy, did Isaiah speak the truth when he was talking, when he was talking. He was talking just about you. He says, you honor with lips your lips you speak it but your hearts are far from me you know in the book of Amos Amos comes in and he's so upset with the children of God sends Amos in and boy I mean Amos comes in and he's so upset and he says you know you sat in your assemblies and he says you're there because you feel like you're commanded to be there that's what you're supposed to do so they're sitting there in their assemblies in the synagogue and they're sitting there and they're worshiping God and they're doing all these things but the whole time they're sitting there they're going why do we have to keep the Sabbath everybody else gets to trade everybody else gets to work on the Sabbath and we're having to keep the Sabbath and it's just not fair and he said your hearts are here or your minds are here, but your hearts are way over yonder. And he says, then when you leave here, having fulfilled your duty of sitting in the synagogue, you go down to your market, to your little store, and people come in to buy grain, and you tell them you're selling them a pound of grain, but you've really got the scale set to three quarters of a pound, but it still reads a pound. And he said, you weigh it out there, and you're cheating people. But oh... Were you a good Jew? You went, you went to temple on Saturday. But boy, come Monday, you're going to cheat folks. Come Wednesday, you're going to cheat folks. Come Friday afternoon, you're going to cheat folks. But boy, let the sun go down, you're quitting working. Jesus looks at the Pharisees and he says, this ceremonial business, this keeping the traditions of men, he says, oh, that's great. But when you honor it more than you honor God, more than when you honor the commands of God, something is wrong. And then Jesus really levels the charge. Look at what he does. He says, and he continued, you have a fine way of setting aside the commands of God in order to observe your own traditions. For Moses said, honor your father and mother, and anyone who curses their father or mother is to be put to death. But you say that if anyone declares that what might have been used to help their father or mother is korban, that is, devoted to God, then you no longer let them do anything for their father or mother. Thus you nullify the word of God by your own tradition so that, that you have handed down and you do many such things like that. Korban. Korban is an interesting word. It's very difficult to define. It simply means devoted to God. There's not a whole lot on this word, korban. It's used here. This is the only place it's used in the New Testament. Jesus says, you declare korban. You're saying something is devoted to God. He says, there's nothing wrong with devoting something to God. That's not what Jesus' beef is. Jesus fuss with them is, is that he says you will devote something korban. You will say this is to be used for God and then you look up. Now think about this. You say I devoted this money to God. I'm giving it to God. And here's mom and dad. They're starving. And you go well mom and dad I would help you but I've korban my money. You know through the years here, I've had people say, man, I'm, I'm just really having a tough time right now. We've got this going on and this happening. And, you know, we've had this medical thing come up and we've had that happen. And, and we're just really struggling. We're not going to be able to give. We're not going to be able to give on Sunday. And I'd say, it's okay. It's okay. 
but I'm supposed to give. Yeah, we're commanded to give, but we're commanded to give cheerfully. We're commanded to how we give. But let me tell you something. If, if all of a sudden, you know, it's one of these things, the type of things that if, if I were on my way here and I got a call from somebody that said, hey, I, I need some money, I need help, I, I think I could easily give whatever I'm going to give to church to help them and I've honored God correct right now giving here is important but if if we go well I, I give to church and then I won't help anybody else something's wrong with my heart correct he said you're you're commanded by Moses he said he said do you like the Ten Commandments well of course they like the Ten Commandments they they said they followed the Ten Commandments he said it says to honor your mother and your father honor your father and mother I, that term honor doesn't just mean go yep that's mom that's dad I know who they are yep uh -huh, I honor them I, I, I call them mom and dad honoring in the biblical sense in the Old Testament sense meant that I'm going to take care of them I'm going to help them out I'm going to do what needs to be done. Of course, you know, there's a side note on that, and I'm going to chase that rabbit real quick because it jumped up. I've taught on this before. Somebody's got to be honorable. Always understand that. If you want your children to honor you, you better be honorable. If you're beating them five ways to Sunday, they're not going to honor you. They're going to get even. <laughs> yeah, they're going to get even. Yeah, exactly. You know, or they're not going to have anything to do with you. That's, that's, you know. So, all right. So back to our text here. So he says, you say, well, I've devoted my money. I, I was going to give this to the temple. And then mom and dad showed up and had a need. Well, I, I'd already said I was going to corban this money. I was going to devote it to God. How better to devote it to God than carrying out what God commanded us to do, correct? That's what Jesus is teaching them here. But he says what's happened is, he says, you'll honor with your lips, but your hearts are far from me. He says, you have taken tradition. You have taken the commands of man and made it more important than the commands of God. You have allowed man's teaching. Listen to what Jesus says, verse 14. Again, Jesus called the crowd to him and said, Listen to me, everyone, and understand this, nothing outside the person can defile them by going into them. Rather, it is what comes out of a person that defiles them. He says, you get all bent out of shape about what a person, how a person ceremonially washes their hands. You get all bent out of shape about that, and you miss doing the very commands of God. It's, it's the reason that I end, one of the reasons that I end my sermons the way that I do every Sunday where I say, listen, we can accept the invitation. We can say, okay, I may need to come down here publicly. There might be, maybe, you know, somebody is here and they go, man, I need prayer or I need to repent about something that, that is something that I need the church to be considering and the church to be praying about and the church to be focused on. The worst thing we can do is that if we come here and we gather together and we sing songs and we do the things that we do and then we leave here and nothing changes about my personal life. If I have my church life where I come in here and I go, this is what the way I'm going to do, this is how I'm going to act, and then I leave here, I leave, and, and, and I fussed about this for years about how, you know, you go to a restaurant and you, you, it's obvious that you've been in church. Now, we're pretty incognito here. You see, I can walk in a restaurant and the people look at me and go, boy, that heathen didn't go to church today. <laughs> but other folks, they show up, but you, can, you can tell, can't you? Now, now, be honest with me. You've done this since I've talked about this. You've gone out to eat on Sunday. We don't do a whole lot of that, but, but I've... You know, you go out to eat on Sunday and you sit down. You can pick out the church crowd, can you not? Right? You just know. They've been to church. They've got that holy glow. They come in, they sit down. And when you've got the holy glow going on, when you've sat down in a restaurant, if you treat the waiter or waitress bad, they know where you've been and they know that you're not living according to what you just did, right? That's what Jesus is talking about here. He says, you worry about what you put into the body when you ought to be worrying about what comes out. 
what comes out of your mouth what comes out of your life what's going on and so then jesus leaves he, he's done he's got his point across and he leaves and he gets in and his disciples are like what do you mean by that um so should we not do the ceremony uh should we you know are we supposed to throw uh you know and so jesus notice jesus response after he left verse 17 he left the crowd and entered the house his disciples asked about this parable are you so dull he asked don't you see that nothing that enters a person or outside can defile them for it doesn't go what doesn't go into the heart but into their stomach and then out of the body in saying this jesus declared all foods clean thank god for that verse we get to eat bacon because bacon was on the unclean list and when Jesus was done bacon was free for all we get to eat it and I can get a hallelujah out of Linda if I keep talking about bacon <laughs> you know I mean it's just you know and so Jesus says listen it's not about it's not about going through some ceremonial washing. It's not about leaving something out or adding something in. It is about what's in the heart. And Jesus gets down to the heart of the matter. Let me tell you something. The heart of the matter, who we are, is, you know, what we do will be shown by what's in our heart. The heart of the matter. You can keep every tradition. You can go to church every Sunday. But if your heart is not changed, I've said this so many times to people in Bible studies and I've applied it to people and I don't, uh, you know, I may sound a little judgmental, but I'm going to tell you something. I, I've said this in Bible study after Bible study and personal studies with people. You've got to be careful because some people love the, like the idea of being saved, but they love being lost. And that's what can happen to us under tradition is we like the idea of it but we love what we want to do but we'll keep our tradition because we think that tradition as long as we do some acts of things then we get to live the way we want Jesus said no listen to what he says verse 20 he went on what comes out of a person is what defiles them for it is within out of a person's heart that evil thoughts come sexual immorality theft murder adultery greed malice deceit lewdness envy slander arrogance and folly all of these evils come from the inside and that's what defiles a person he says it is a battle for the heart that's what we're in we're in for a a battle for the heart that we've got to change the hearts and minds of people and jesus works on the heart jesus doesn't come in and go oh okay let me let me give you some steps if you'll follow these steps if you'll do these things then all of a sudden you'll get right with me he says it's a matter of the heart that you've got to turn your heart over to god that's the power that's the power in the and the and the and the way Paul paints the picture of baptism in Romans chapter 6 where he says that there's a there's a, the whole chapter discussing that he says what happens is, is you're taking one thing off of the heart the throne of the heart yourself because the self is dying and you're letting Jesus move in on the throne of your heart and he says once you've done that he says all of a sudden you are living differently thinking differently acting differently because what is coming out of us is coming out of us is Jesus on the throne of our hearts and he says it's no longer about what what we're doing yes there are things in worship that are important yes all of those things are important but if we think for a moment that we're just going to come in here and God's going to punch our time card for us and go wow you know they're good you're good I'm good for another week I can go do what I want he's saying no there's got to be a change from within a change of the heart and Jesus says we've got to get off this idea that we can go through some ceremony and that makes us right there have been many times through the years over the last couple of years especially that I've had couples come to me and want me to do their wedding and so if I don't know the couple if I don't know them and they call me and they say hey we got your name from such and such would you do our wedding I have a rule I say okay I, I want you to do something I want you to come because first of all I want you to meet me because I may not be what you want 
So you better come, you better come and meet me. Secondly, I sit down and I talk to them and I listen to what they say. Before, we, before I say, okay, we're going to have to do some marriage counseling and all that. And so we're going to have to talk because, you know what? I see so many couples making all kinds of plans for the wedding ceremony and no plans for the marriage. And you can have grandiose, wonderful ceremonies and their marriage hit the rock. I've done two weddings that were very memorable for me as far as that illustrates this point. One was where there was every bit of planning and money spent to make it beautiful, and it lasted six weeks. They were in divorce court within six weeks. It took them longer to get the divorce than they had been together. The second one, was thrown together in a spur of the moment, stand on the front porch, do the wedding while the burgers were grilling for the reception. No thought, nothing, they're still married. The thing is, the two brides were sisters. A friend told me later, he said, he looked at me and he said, that first wedding was awesome. But you ought to be have your license taken away from you because of the second one. He goes, you should never have been a part of that. And I said, well, I, I had talked to both couples. The first couple fooled me. The second couple, I knew what they were facing. But they, could, they weren't planning for a wedding. They were planning for a marriage. Now, over 20 years later, they're still married. The other one, she's on marriage number five because she's planned weddings and not marriages. What happens to us is that we get wrapped up in I'll do this, but nothing changes in the heart. And Jesus says it's what's in the heart that matters. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you, we love you, we praise you. We thank you for Jesus, our Savior. We thank you for saving us. Father, you have saved us from death, and you have saved us from our sins, and we praise you for that. Father, it is easy to get wrapped up in things that become what we think are important when you're saying the change of heart is what is most important. So, Father, we pray today that you will change our hearts. We understand the idea of worship and all the things that are important. But, Father... Help us never to worship the wrong thing, but to worship you and to put our focus on you. Father, we ask you to change our hearts in the areas where things need to be changed. We ask you to touch us and be with us. And Father, for that to happen, we're going to need you to work mightily by your Spirit in our lives. We ask you to lead us and guide us. Father, we're going to sing a song to encourage anybody that might need to come publicly. But Father, we ask you to take this invitation. Help us to take what we've learned from your word and apply it in our lives this week. So Father, it's through all these things that we ask in the name of our Savior Jesus. Amen. If you need to come forward this morning, you can do that. But again, the greatest invitation we can accept is to leave here and live for God. Let's stand and sing together.
All right, several things to remember. Of course, we'll have our Wednesday night fellowship at 6 at our house. Um, remember all those on our prayer list. Who, what else do we need to announce? Uh, two Sundays from uh, the 9th. I, I noticed Kathy's got the sign-up sheet back there. Uh, July 9th, there'll be a potluck. And uh, so check that out back there. Um, what else? Anything else? No, we're going to do it on the 10th. Yeah, I didn't figure, I figured with the third being the way it was, people would have plans for the fourth, so do it, move it to the tenth. Anything else? Well, let's pray. We'll leave singing together. Father God, thank you for loving us. Thank you for giving us Jesus and giving us your spirit. We ask you today to watch over us, to lead us, to guide us. Father, bless us as we leave here. Help us to grow in our love for you and our love for each other. To the blessed name of our Savior Jesus, we ask all these things. Amen. Amen.